Okay, so welcome to part three of my series on how I made the song Crow's Eye, which is from my newest solo release, What's Coming. This last part of the series is going to focus on the mix for the song. Of course, when you're working completely on your own, like I did for this EP, the mix wasn't something that I started after everything was recorded. I was building the mix the entire time I was writing and recording the song, and that's a luxury that working entirely in the box affords you. Hard to imagine working any other way after you've done it this way for a while. But for those who have worked in the analog world, you know the kind of anxiety I'm talking about when you have to switch from recording mode to mixing mode and reset all your equipment. You're always worried about losing settings or maybe you find out later you like the rough mix, but the vocals weren't finished yet and now you can't really get back to it. So nowadays the process is so smooth and fluid, you can pretty much redo anything at any point, which is awesome, but it has its own pitfalls. This song is a little bit different than a lot of the things that I work on, both as an artist and as a mixer for other artists, in the sense that it's it's pretty sparse, doesn't have like big distorted guitars, which kind of requires a different set of tools when you're mixing denser music like that. Because the drums have been sort of left live in Superior Drummer, I'm really using the mixer in Superior Drummer to do all my drum mixing. And then uh, just on the bus, I have a tiny bit of high shelf starting at around 1K, just to brighten it up just a hair. Bass. It's the basic tone, but I just needed a lot more brightness in the mid-range to make it cut in the mix. But I didn't want it to be clicky high, so I kind of rolled everything off the very top. And maybe just a little bit of uh, compression, you know, 340B of compression. This is the Brainworks Solid State Logic e-channel emulation. A lot of uh, my early mixing work was done on consoles and SSL was definitely one of the main ones I used all the time on a lot of records I did. So I like channel strips that look like consoles I've worked on. And on the bass bus, we have this virtual mix bus by Slate Digital. Just a really cool and subtle harmonic generating what you would get on a console. Probably gonna hear a bit of a level drop when I bypass it, yeah. So um, sometimes I try and keep my processors not adding too much volume boost so that I can uh, evaluate them more honestly, I, I guess you would say. And other times I already know what I'm going to get out of them and I don't care. And then I'm doing some additional little boosts in the 600 and 3K range here on the bus again. And a little bit of a sub cut and a little bit of a cut around 150, 130. Okay, so that's what's going on with the bass. Guitars. And then on the bus, pretty much nothing except a very subtle high pass filter. Let's see what we're doing on the individual channels. Uh, it looks like we've got the same channel strip that I have on the um, on the bass tracks. Got a high pass filter here set at 120. Again, not a whole lot of heavy handed processing, but this was a sound that had a heavy chain we saw in the previous section. The sound is baked in here already, and I'm just adding a little bit more echo. Oh, on the CS80 track, this sound was too bright for this bridge. Just had a little bit too much high end and high mids. So I'm doing quite a bit of um, cutting there. Just looking at this high pass filter real quickly. This is what the frequency response would be if this wasn't engaged. And you can see how much you're 
you're mitigating it by one of the reasons I really love this plugin and use it a lot. The Keys Reverb is a universal audio plugin. It's their EMT plate emulation. It comes standard with, I think, almost all their hardware. Keys Delay, I think I already showed. I'm using the Valhalla Delay. I love that you have this spread control of the delays because I do like very stereo delays. Valhalla is a great plugin company. They make a lot of awesome sounding plugins and they're super super affordable and their whole setup is really easy to authorize i really support these guys i think i have pretty much all the plugins that they make okay so that's keyboards lead vocals pretty much walked you through my processing on the on the lead vocals in that section probably didn't talk too much about what i'm doing on the bus with the vocals i showed you how i was using the uh, sibilance de on the individual track Tracks, but it's kind of interesting that I have another de on the lead vocal bus. This is an older Waves plugin. It's a little more broadband. It doesn't have quite as many parameters, but I do like it sometimes. It's just like an overall net at the end of a vocal bus, just to sort of collect and mitigate those last few S's that are popping through. This one is set very conservatively, not working too hard. Just there to grab maybe just a few spiky S's. Backing vocals. Okay, so I've already printed this as a stem because sometimes I want to do some pretty heavy processing and sometimes I just don't want to think about it. After I've made kind of a dramatic decision, I just want to print that as a stem, have that sound baked in. I don't even want the option of going back. I always have that option because I can go back. I've got the inactive version of this somewhere deep in the bowels of the session, but nine times out of 10, I'm not going to go back that far. Part of mixing for me is reducing your options as you progress in the mix. I printed the ooze as a stem, and now I'm treating them right on the track. I am doing a filtering situation here with the Pro Q3, where I'm cutting off a lot of low end and some high end. There's some sort of low sort of hum there that's a little distracting, so I just lop that right off. And then ultimately, I think I found that the very uh, highest part here was making the ooze vocal stand out a little bit too much against its inspiration or what it's doubling, which is the keyboard part. And so what I wanted it to do was hide inside of the keyboard part. So you're not sure, is there a vocal even doubling that or not? So I decided the way to reduce its noticeability was to roll off some of its high end. But then, of course, I am smashing it. <laughs> to uh, bring out the performance in terms of the pitch ramping up and ramping down and creating that sort of swirly chorus effect with the keyboards. And here's with it on. That's so low in the mix that you don't hear the artifacts of the compression because you barely even hear this part. It, this is part of another sound, so smashing it hard doesn't have a whole lot of negative repercussions to it because it's part of a, a greater whole. I am adding some additional reverb. And that, of course, is the UID plate reverb. Okay, so backing vocals is the last bus. Now we have our whole mix together. Now, this is our stereo bus, right? And this is where I keep most of the stereo bus processing that I'm using during a mix. This kind of workflow showing your stereo bus, your stereo bus compressor, your tape machine. This is what it's like to mix in an analog studio. You can always see this stuff when you're working. You know, you just turn your head and tape machine's there. The bus compressor's usually on the console. And you want to be able to see this stuff while you're working. It just gives you a good idea of where you are level-wise when you're printing to be able to see these meters. How much gain reduction I have on the stereo bus how hard I'm hitting the tape machine, the output of the tape machine going into the next EQ plug-in here, the VMR, the Virtual Mix Bus. I've got these on each of the individual group buses, and then I've got another one on the stereo bus itself. Is that too many? I don't know. I've picked the Brit 4KE, which is the SSL 
kind of going through the different selections and see what they're doing to the mix. So I'm just going to kind of flip through these, see if you can hear the difference. This one is, you know, more sympathetic to the song to me. But the other thing that's going on here is that once you kind of get a setting and you've been mixing the song with this setting, of course the other settings aren't going to sound quite as good because you've already been mixing to this setting. SSL bus compressor, talked about this a lot in other episodes. So one thing that I'm doing while I'm mixing is I do bypass these because one thing that I don't want to do is have one of these plugins being completely responsible for the blend. I like to know that my mix is kind of intact with all this stuff off. The flavor of the mix is still there. This stuff is here to enhance it, bring out certain details in it, and that's what's going on here. We're getting a little bit of overall volume boost. I've got 2.5 dB of makeup gain. Got the threshold set to 6 dB. You know, we're getting about 4 dB of gain reduction on the kick hits. That's one of the main things that this is doing right now is what it's doing to the drum specifically the kick drum here's with it off again and just listen to the kick drum and now it's much more forward punchier and more on top of the mix the snare drum is as well and now what's happening is the, the instruments are kind of like fighting a little bit more. Like there's a little bit more give and take, a little bit more. There's some pumping going on in the uh, amount of compression. But it's making the whole thing sound a little bit more alive. I have a lot of different tape machine plugins these days. There's a lot of different companies making them. This one is UAD, and it's their version of the Ampex ATR-102, which was my preferred mix-down deck when I worked in analog studios in the past. This just has so many cool options that are really kind of impractical to do on a real one. First of all, just by a click, you can change the tape width, quarter inch, half inch, or one inch. And then you've got four different flavors of tape recipe, I guess. Over here, you'll notice that you have the tape speed, and I'm running it at 15 ips, inches per second. It's a little noisier. But, of course, you could turn the noise off because this is a digital plugin. V2B into Chorus 2. Essentially what you have here is another level of EQ. It's the kind of EQ where there's no indication of what's actually happening when you boost it. And the knobs are a little small and hard to see what you're doing. So you're basically just forced to use your ears. And I really like using both kinds of plugins. Ones that you can't see how you're affecting the sound in a visual feedback way like this one. And ones where you can. I import this setting from different sessions all the time. This is something I've landed on with this one inch the 456 the plus six alignment and the 15 ips it just makes your mix have a lot more depth a lot more lows a lot more highs the whole thing just sounds more interesting and more alive and all right so what's happening with my eq down here just doing actually some really pretty subtle stuff i am doing a high pass this is kind of a typical setup I might have on a stereo bus. I picked a high mid frequency to boost, three quarters of a dB of boosting at 2.3K. It's really just four points. We've got a, a high shelf all the way up at 30K. So that's just a very airy top. And then I've got just a tiny bit of like a half dB cut at 400. And a lot of times you will look in that area to kind of clear up mud, allow the mid range and the higher mids to speak more clearly and allow the fundamental base region of like 100, 120 to have its own range as well.
great thing about this plugin is you can see what your frequency response is. Overall, the frequency response pretty even. It's just kind of nice to have that confirmed when you're mixing away and you're landing in a good spot. Like in photography, you would call it a, a robust negative. Gives you a lot to play with. Mastering if you decide, oh, I do want it to be a little bit brighter. I just gave it a kiss in the 10K region. I just blew it a little light kiss. I love when mastering people talk like that. So that wraps up Crow's Eye. I've taken you through the guitar, the drums, the bass, the keyboards, the backing vocals, the lead vocals, and some mixing tips. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I will see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.